Professor Stephen Retton. Steve Retton is a professor of the Faculty of Ar Agriculture and Life Sciences at Lincoln University, and he's been involved in a book, Ecological Engineering for Pest Management, um, a, essentially a lifetime of experience he's going to share with us okay. in the next short while. Thank you. Anyway, I'll change the subject now, but not really. I'll change the detail, but not the theme. Um, I'm taking farmland as my theme in New Zealand and elsewhere. Just to put you in the picture, in our lowlands, where we all live and work mainly, less than 1% of New Zealand's native vegetation remains. I think only the lowlands of Hawaii would be as bad, to be honest. Less than 1% of our native veg, and probably less than 1% of um, everything else as well. So my little theme is, it's a bit of a paradigm really, I, I believe in biodiversity of the right type in the right place, not just as a, not as a conflict with agriculture and its productivity, but it, it should be and is beginning to be um, an integral part of ag agricultural production systems. And that's rather a great thing to say, given that we have virtually nothing left in our lowlands, lowlands anyway. And let me see if I can give you some evidence why I think there is a change rolling here, and um, the, the change is driven by science and lots of other things. Um, one of the great themes we always push is this thing you must have heard of, which are called nature uh, ecos ecosystem services. If I'm talking to farmers, I call I mean, other non-scientists, I call them the services of nature. And to give an example, pest control by ladybirds, to put it crudely, means if it works, we don't need um, pesticides uh, moving towards sustainability. And if we can cut out pesticides and other things like that on farmland, including weed killers, then of course we cut down the farmer's variable costs, which is the pesticide itself, labour and diesel, and of course we can if we're lucky, improve eco-tourism and eco-marketing and all those other eco-things and contribute to sustainability in a general sense. There's a lot of marketing behind this once we do the science and this is one of my favourite examples of marketing. Two ways of keeping the um, burglars out. <laughs> <laughs> so the burglar might go through the left-hand gate but probably think twice about going through the right. So it's only four words and a few little lines but there's a lovely message there and I think a lot of the work we're doing and others really does add marketing to ecology, and that's one of the reasons why we have some successes. So I'll give you some background, and I'll give you some examples of what we think we've achieved. What are these things that I keep butchering on about these ecosystem services? Well, I won't go mad about it, but I'll give you some examples, and it should really resonate. You must, it's obvious what the value of these is. And this is, a, this is some of about 20 or 25 that people normally recognize. Just to put it in perspective, TB fruit in this country is worth 1.5 billion New Zealand dollars per year, mainly exported. Without the honeybee, we'd have no kiwi fruit. Simple as that. And pollinators worldwide, including the honeybee, are declining dangerously, including not just New Zealand. So, the top one on that list, one crop, kiwi fruit, 1.5 billion. Worldwide pollination, I think, is worth something like uh, 750 billion dollars per year. And all the others you can understand quite easily. The bottom ones as well, tourism and aesthetics, are services of nature. Four million people get off aeroplanes in Auckland each year here, and when they're interviewed, they come to see lots of things, but the greenness and the mountains and all that nature that they talk about. Well, ecotourism and aesthetics are important services of nature. But agriculture is damaging them, and I rather like this quotation from William Blake, a tree is not just a green thing that stands in the way. Well... I'm not mocking dairy, I wouldn't dare because I'll get shot, but the first thing that the creation of a dairy farm does is to cut down the trees. And William Blake says that um, there's more than just trees, but trees being an annoyance. What about these ecosystem services? Do they matter? Well, you probably know if you've done some reading. Costanza, who we've published with recently, was in Vermont, and now he's gone to Portland in Oregon. He, he and colleagues worked out the value of these things globally, and it was a very brave effort. And as long ago as 13 years, they were worth 33 trillion US dollars, which was then twice the world's GDP. So if someone says, what's all this witchery not about this vague thing called ecosystem services? Well, twice the value of the world's GDP. We're losing biodiversity, we're losing the services it provides, and of course that, that figure has probably gone down a bit now. Because, as I said already, we're losing biodiversity at the worrying rate that's the fastest since the last, last ice age. And unfortunately, good old agriculture is the main cause worldwide. 
remember the 1% of native vegetation left in our lowlands. And what I find quite shocking, really, is that the current rate of consumption by all of us is such that we are um, using the Earth's resources at one and a half times the rate that they can be put back, which doesn't sound very sustainable to me. Just to illustrate that effect of agriculture, I like this picture. Um, this is the Amazon jungle in Brazil, <laughs> believe it or not. It's actually about one hectare of jungle, and all around it is this rather impoverished soil that's been blasted by heavy rain. Of course, forest soils are often poor, and that's being used to grow soya, to grow cattle, to make hamburgers, to export to North America. And that soil's doomed. It's going to be washed into the Amazon at this rate. And when we're looking about conservation of vertebrates, many large vertebrates, birds or mammals, can't survive in one hectare. One hectare. It's too small for their territory and for feeding. So we call that islandization, and islandization is all around us. Look at the Banks Peninsula, which isn't far from here. You see little pockets of native bush in the valleys, and all around it is heavily grazed sheep country. So we've created our islands in our lowlands and in our hills as well. So they are monocultures, these things, and there's the Canterbury Plain that many of us live in or live near. And it's a nice picture to buy on a postcard, but um, probably I can't find a native plant in that picture apart from around these farmhouses, if you're lucky. All the field boundaries are Cupressus macrocarpa, or Pinus radiata, or gorse from Europe. All the crops, of course, originate from Europe, and initially the Middle East, many of them. The earthworms are non-native. The fungi in the soil are non-native. The weeds are non-native. They do have some function, these things, but if I wanted a hedge to give some function to a field, I wouldn't use Cupressus macrocarpa. It's like Hades underneath that. That, that plant, I must say. We're not alone, that's southeast England, not very impressive. There used to be a hedge along here, and the British government, as you may know, fa paid farmers to remove hedges, and they lost 140,000 miles, that's about 400,000 kilometres of hedge, paid for by the government. Now the European Union in Brussels is paying farmers to put the hedges back, but they're not doing it very quickly. That's cotton in Australia, ultimate monoculture, 1,000 hectares of one plant. Put it crudely, how would the ladybird live here where there's no shelter and the soil temperature reaches 45 centigrade? It's not surprising that cotton has been the crop in the world with the greatest insecticide use. I could find a pesticide in this shirt. This is a cheap Chinese shirt. I bet I could find some tiny quantities of pesticide in this shirt if I put it into the right machine. Vineyards, which we do a lot of work in. There's a lovely picture taken by Kevin Judd in Marlborough, in in the morning, but we don't know what you see. I might, you see the yeah, basis of a good advert for Sauvignon Blanc. I see Vitis vinifera, that's a vine, in, in laser guided lines. And if you're lucky, there might be ryegrass in between, cut to a very low height because of frost minimization. They want the air to flow. And you might see lots of mud in between those rows, historically, with heavy herbicide use. So people buy wine based on pictures like this, but those of us who know some ecology are a little bit need a bit more persuading. So, we think biodiversity is low in these places, it's just a mantra we recite, but what's the evidence? We have to do some ecological work, don't we? Well, we did, and this is the only data slide I'll show you, maybe one of two, so bear with me. That's very important, I think. We worked out the rate of disappearance in arable land, not, not vineyards, of green fly, aphids, and of the eggs of a fly. If you grow carrots, you get maggots in the carrot, many pests lay eggs on the soil surface. So we put out green fly in arable fields on the ground. They often drop off plants. And we put out the eggs of a pest. And we did it in conventional paddocks, the sorts of things you've seen in those images, and in organic paddocks. We did about 30 fields. And this axis is very important. This is the percentage of those pests, green fly or egg, that disappears in, disappear in one day and one night. Well, you don't need to be a wizard on stats to see that um, there's something funny not going on in the brown ones, which is conventional. That dominates. Canterbury. I said that agriculture destroys biodiversity. Well, whatever's eating the green fly and the eggs has virtually disappeared from these paddocks. And uh, Shakespeare said something's rotten in the state of Denmark. What was that? Was that Hamlet? Someone's educated. Well, I'm not saying something's rotten in the state of Arab agriculture in New Zealand. It wouldn't be so rude, but there's a lot missing. So in, in organic fields, it's pretty obvious that if you get rid of a third of these pests in one night, come back in a couple of days and there's no pest left. 1% disappearance, you've got a long wait. So there's a nice illustration of how biodiversity and its function has been clobbered in our lowlands.
but we have to measure something first. Where do we send our wine and our kiwi fruit? To European and North American and Japanese, Japanese supermarkets. What does Marks and Spencers say when you go in and buy a can of orange juice? 15% um, sugar, by the way. Um, <laughs> they say that. Now, I think that is beautiful marketing. They're not saying it's cheaper. They're not saying it's um, tastier. They're not saying it's better than the, the products of Tesco and Sainsbury's. But they are actually better because there's what it hasn't got in it. And if you want to see some powerful environmental marketing, that's it. And that's where we send our legs of lamb and our venison and all the rest of it. You may have read a couple of years ago, Germany sent back hundreds and hundreds of cases of white wine here because there was too much copper in them. You may have read that two years ago, Korea, which is not the most sophisticated country in the world, but it's growing fast, sent back beef. Because that too much of an insecticide in it called carbofuran, oh sorry, not carbofuran, endosulfan. Endosulfan kills earthworms. They use it on cricket pitches. Korea sent back our beef. So we want to watch it. If we don't put these ecosystem services back in a tangible way, they'll keep sending our stuff back. What about farmers? Are they on our side? Well, historically, farmers are conservative. I don't mean that to be critical. Farmers, as a, as a cohort worldwide, are quite slow to move. This cartoon from the USA in the 19th century, I mean, that, you know, if anybody believes that, there's no hope, is there? Even as a single share ca hair casts a shadow, does a weed steal profit from the harvest? Well, come on, that means monoculture rules okay, doesn't it? One weed, I don't mean to harvest, it's not that bad. Of course we can have biodiversity in agriculture if it's the right thing in the right place.